We're here. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the slightly late start there, everybody. Minor technical issues, what with being in a different country has caused some excitement this evening. But I'm very happy to say we are now live and I'm here with my friend and yours, Mr. Paul Sanders. Good evening, Paul. Hi, Sam. It's lovely to see you in Italy. <laughs> Thank I you. I expected you to like pass it down your shirt or something, but no. <laughs> no, I've, been, I've even cleaned myself up just for this evening's affair. Um, it's going to be slightly uh, different this evening because I'm, I'm operating on a different sort of set of technical things. So I'm going to keep my eye on the comments as best I can. And uh, I will be throwing any questions that come in at you, Paul. So make sure you're paying attention. But we're going to get into some mobile phone photography and yes. uh, how Paul uses it. And also we're going to talk about the images because it kind of doesn't matter what they're shot on these days. And maybe that's a question I'll throw at you. But can we start, Paul, with maybe how you use your mobile phone photographically now compared to how you might have used it a couple of years ago? Um, yeah, I sort of I started using my uh, mobile phone just to sketch ideas down. Um, you know, I sometimes draw ideas, but often I'll just take a little series of photographs around a subject with my phone just to give me an idea of positioning or lighting or, or you know that kind of thing. Um, but now, because they're so much more sophisticated, I use it for everything from macro to long exposure, um, and they're they're really wonderful because of the convenience. Um, and people, you know, often get fascinated by all the, the apps and the tricks that you can do, but they're a really, really versatile, real camera that produce very usable, very printable files. Um, you know, I mean, some of the workshops we've done in the past have been captured to print with an iPhone, um, and they've been amazing, you know, the pictures have been amazing, but the latest group of smartphones the the sensors are fantastic the the, the file size rivals some you know mid-range sort of um slr type cameras and can i just check because i mean we talk we sort of moniker it iphoneography but i mean you can obviously use any type of smartphone these days but are you are you an iphone shooter still i am i threw my soul in with apple um when the very first iphone came out and i been one of those suckers who upgrades every time every time every time um but the you know the the iphone's a very good camera because a lot of the apps sort of are made for it the android camera i think is probably better than the iphone the lens quality on some of the huawei ones is is it's superb and the sensor size is really big um you know but the cameras are versatile it doesn't really matter whether you use an android or whether you use a an iphone um the 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 whole idea is that it's the convenience of a camera in your pocket that enables you to capture moments that happen you know sort of so quickly you wouldn't have even got your zip undone on your camera bag before you see them um and you know if you're traveling around you might not want to take a big camera with you you might just want something that's very discreet that people don't even notice. And the, the joy of a phone, certainly for street photography, is that nobody notices you take your phone out and take a picture. You know, if you imagine 10 years ago, if we saw people in the street turning the camera, or turning a proper camera on themselves to take a selfie, we'd have thought they were mad. Now it doesn't even register because so many people are doing it. Um, and I think the the joy of phone photography is the freedom it gives you and the anonymity um, you know and I, I think that's something that street photographers in particular you know would you know would enjoy um, yeah so. and I think um, as, and welcome everyone who's joining and jumping on here we've got people in Aberdeenshire, Wimbledon, Newark, West Wales, Scottish Borders Cheshire, Dorset, I'm basically naming places now. Um, Sheerness, Liverpool. Um, you should go to random places that you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, I haven't dropped anything Italian in yet. Hi from yeah. Bath. And a couple of people saying oh, they don't have an iPhone or they've got an old iPhone or they've got a Huawei or whatever. But as you've just alluded to there, Paul, it, it's, not the, it's not the phone. It's the fact it's right there with you and how that can affect your yeah. shooting style. Exactly. And, you know, the... The, the key thing to remember with phone shooting, whether it's an and, uh, you know, a, a Huawei, a, a Samsung, a, you know, whatever, or an iPhone, is to work within the limits of the kit. 
you know and you know so if you've got an old iphone or whether you've got the latest you know spandangly one as long as you work within the kind of restraints of the the sensor and the lens capability actually you'll get a really usable image um and i you know i remember when i was working at the times we would get pictures from mobile phones that were so tiny mm. and we blew them up to whole page sizes even then um you know so now i mean you can easily print you know a3 without a problem a2 um if you don't crop yeah and for yeah for most people, that's as big as you'd ever probably need it to be as well. Um, yeah. I just we, We're not going to spend ages on the actual apps or the, the technicals of it too much, but I, it was interesting you mentioned that you use it also for different things like the long exposure, which some people yeah. might think, well, how, how do you do that? You don't have a filter. So can you just talk through a couple of these and then we'll get into the images, Paul? Yeah. So I would say 90% of the photographs that I shoot with a, the phone are taken on the actual camera that's native to the... Um, uh, to the phone um, but then I, I use other apps so I'll use photo split to create multiple exposure type images um, I use Snapseed for all of my processing um, I use slow shutter to create long exposure effects although the latest round of phones so the iPhone everything from the iPhone 8 up 8 plus up um, you can do long exposure in the actually in the the phone itself. You don't need, you don't need third party apps, um, and you know then there are some other other bits and pieces. So Instax Share I use to print directly from the phone if I'm out on location. Um, you know, like I say, Snapseed I use for all my processing. I I don't at the moment use Lightroom Mobile, and the reason for that is I don't actually know my way around it. I'll be really honest. I know my way around Snapseed with my eyes closed. Um, the other app there, Circular, is great for producing little spirally type things. And the ND Timer app is for my long exposure calculations because my fingers only got to 10. So when I got to 15 stops, I'm not taking my shoes and socks off for anybody. <laughs> it's not really the conditions for it normally. So, OK, well, hopefully that gives everyone a little snapshot. <laughs> See what I did there of the um, apps that might be in use. And uh, <clears throat> good at this aren't I and like we say Paul and um, actually Adrian are doing uh, mobile phone photography workshops for Lineland in November this year so if you were interested that might be something to check out um, in North Devon in North Devon exactly okay but what we wanted to do as well was get into the images and um, I suppose you know, you know let's talk about them as images obviously because that's what they are but I think if there are elements where it, maybe the mobile phone side of it came into relevance because it might have been where you were or what you didn't have with you or or that you were sketching an idea so to speak on it maybe kind of drop us in on that as well Paul but this first yeah. one tell us a little bit more what we're, um, what we're looking at so this I, I get a great deal of joy from first thing in the morning and um, so I love I love it when I come downstairs in the morning to make my first cup of tea and the light streams through the lounge window and we've got a very very dark um, paint on the inside of the inside of the room and I love the way the shadows are picked out on it um, and the different depths in the shadows now I always have my phone in my pocket even in my PJs first thing in the morning there's a, a site that none of you will be able to unsee now um, I'm pulling so, the plug <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I what I enjoy is the fact that I can you know I can just take the phone out and photograph something very simply without having to go to the rigmarole of getting the bag out, getting the camera out, set the tripod up. You know, this is literally a snapshot. And I still take time to compose it how I want. Um, I still shoot the square aspect ratio if I'm thinking of it as a square. So I take into consideration things like that. But it means that when I'm a bit blurry eyed first thing in the morning, I don't have to start thinking about all the stuff that goes with the camera, you know, what lens to shoot. I just pick up the phone take the photograph I can adjust the exposure you know just by tapping the screen and sliding your finger up and down a little bit and you get the exposure that you like but I love little moments like this they fill me with amazing joy just to see the shadows on the wall with the sunlight and you get that kind of wonderful sort of layering effect um you know would I would I bother doing it on my on my GFX to be honest probably not it's too much hassle um, and then when I finish, I, you know, I do a little processing with it. Um, on the phone, I always shoot everything in colour and then process it through to black and white in Snapseed. 
and then I put this lovely little board on the frame on it so that it looks like it's being sold by John Lewis. And that just convinces me that somebody somewhere wants to buy my pictures. <laughs> but I mean, you joke about that, but I think um, one thing, if anyone knows and follows you, your work and they see your Instagram and your website and, you know, you have to be consistent in how you present your work to the public. Right. And one thing you are, you're not one thing, one of the many things I can say it to you um, <laughs> You know, you're, you are very consistent in that delivery of, of your presentation of your work. And I think a lot of people sometimes don't pay enough attention to that. Mm. Yeah, consi- I think consistency is the key. Um, because if you're consistent in the way you present your work, it allows you to, to drop in pictures that are taken on a phone, on a, a pinhole camera, cyanotype, everything within a sort of format works. And people are... That they see the format, they don't see the format change, but your style can evolve really slowly through a consistent you know, method of display. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to just keep us moving just for time purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, but for anyone who's jumping on later as well, welcome aboard. We're going to be talking about some images that Paul's been uh, shot with his phone, and which is one element of it, but obviously the images we're going to talk about separately to that as well. And there's two images here, Paul, because we've kind of got a before and after coming up haven't we so tell us sure you know, yeah what you wanted to kind of walk, walk us through that process um what i i love photographing flowers um and i i don't i don't really do very much in the way of color work but when i when i use my phone like i said earlier i i always shoot color um and then allow the black and white to sort of evolve um from it and what I was fascinated by this rose was the sort of softness and just trying to get an image that represented the softness of it. So what I've done is I've left it the pink that it came out, which is fairly true to color without actually altering it too much. But then I've softened the edges using within Snapseed itself as an app called Lens, a, a bit of the a tool called Lens Blur. And that enables you just to sort of soften little bits of the image without doing an overall softening. Um, so you, you can use that just to knock back details or, you know, create a sort of slightly more romanticized feel. Hmm. Um, and it, it's quite strange because I rarely manipulate my real photographs. But with my phone, I'm quite happy to play. I'll play all day um, with the images on my phone until I get more of a feel. Um, somehow... I used to treat them as disposable, but now I treat them as, um, you know, sort of experimental seeing. Mm. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's sort of a, a parallel stream with my, um, you know, with my other work. And do you find there's some crossover on that? You know, do you explore subjects sometimes with the phone and then think, okay, I'm going to come back and come back? Oh, not, yeah. not with the, as in, I'm going to come back with the real gear and do it properly, because it's not that, but is it, a case of I want to come back and explore this further with my other setup for different yeah. reasons. Yeah, and I, I, I'll use it, um, you know, so often, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a sketchbook. Um, and then an idea will start to form and I'll start to, to photograph it and then I'll think, actually, I need to go deeper. So then I'll start working with my other camera. It's very, very hard to replicate a picture you take on the phone with, you know, a, a sort of a traditional camera i don't want to call them proper cameras because no no <laughs> no but yeah a traditional style camera we, we yeah, know what you mean yeah style camera. um it, it's really hard because the dynamic range on the on the phone seems to be enormous you can i mean like this is you know super close mm. um you know i'm literally you know a few a few centimeters away um and what's also really nice about it is you can play with you know random bits of lens or bits you know bits of glass so if you've got a lens at home like a 50 mil lens or something like that you can actually shoot through it with your iphone to create an even more macro feel if you really want to um you know but this one's just taken um fairly straight with the standard um iphone lens and um, and then just you know shot as a square but i just loved all the little circles and there's something fun and not you're not sort of taking it so seriously I don't kind of put a berry and a cravat on when I'm going to do iPhone pictures, which is what I always wear when I do my square black and white. I can attest to that, everyone. I've been out with him plenty of times. Um, yeah, this, I love this image for lots of reasons, but that contrast as well between the softness and, the, and yet the, the 
paint the clarity of the leaves here, not, not from a technical point of view, but just in terms of a texture point of view. And they really do envelop, you know, we feel this is lovely and cocooned. But I'm interested then, you know, you process that and you think about that in colour, which is rare for you, as we know. Yeah. Um, and then there is a black and white interpretation of that. You see, that for me says so much more. Um, and what I've done here literally is just taken that, that colour image, gone into Snapseed using the black and white conversion in Snapseed. Um, and just then adjusted the warmth of the image and um, so it comes up like a little it almost looks split toned and mm. um, you know, so you can add a little bit of cool or a little bit of warm so you can get a real signature sort of feel um, and then i've allowed the there's a, a the softness has got a little bit of a vignette over it just to draw the line a bit more and um, you know and I, I i enjoy that image much more than the color one um, why because it's black and white. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, do you, you find the colour a distraction, right? But you... Yeah, I, I do. Um, and when I look at it, I, when I look at the rose, you know, when I look at things, any subject, I see it in colour. But I see the colours rendered as tones. And that works the same way for my, my phone photography. I, you know, although I shoot it in colour, I turn it all black and white. Um, I like the simplicity and the elegance of black and white. Um, and it disguises a multitude of sins of a, a photographer who often doesn't know what he's doing and he's just fumbling around, to be honest. Uh, photography is play. The iPhone allows you to play um, and play without fear of judgment, you know, because people look at it and they don't think you're serious. So you can, you can get away with a multitude of mistakes when you, when you shoot on your, on your smartphone. You don't, you don't need to be a perfectionist. Uh, you don't need the technical excellence that people talk about that drives them to distraction. You know, I mean, if you look right in the centre, there's no detail right on that centre peak. It's a bit blown out, but does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Weirdly, there's more detail in the shadows than there is in the highlights. <laughs> but this is it. I mean, I think, um, I think people get, you know, maybe it's uh, easy to get anchored behind the equipment. And it, that becomes a technical process that we burden our minds with because it's easier to wrangle with that in a way or blame bits of it than it is to come to the actual challenge of how you make some interesting work and or how you interpret things, which is a difficult and moving object, right? And this sort yes. of image is quite different. You know, it's, it's the colour, it's shape, it's, it's line, but it's texture, you know. So, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't see this from you normally. no. No, but this is my waiting for pizza image. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that, seriously, this, this was taken while waiting for pizza. Um, where I live, um, the, uh, the takeaway um, place is next to a, a restaurant that has a lot of um, uh, Buddhist prayer flags outside. So while I'm standing waiting for my pizza, I just noticed the light coming through these prayer flags. So I just started playing. I mean, I'm waiting for a pizza. I'm leaning against the fence and I'm just photographing the, pe the prayer flags. And then I use photo split just to layer them on top of each other. And just like the uh, multiple exposure modes in uh, the, the Canon or some of the Nikons, you've got all those light and dark and um, blending techniques that you can apply to the, the iPhone image. And, and then you get, you know, these lovely layered pictures, which are, which are great fun. I'm, I'm never going to do anything with a colour picture because it's just out of my, out of my soul. But it doesn't mean that I can't enjoy, you know, just getting out of my comfort zone and playing with colour occasionally. And the fact that I use the phone, it gives me permission. Um, you know, and that's, that's the important thing to give yourself permission to play. And if using a different camera, I, you know, even if it's the, the smartphone, gives you that permission, allows you to the freedom to, to stop doing what you normally do and do something a bit different, then I would take that because it makes you see things in a different way when you come back to using your, you know, your normal camera. Yeah. Paul, a couple of quick technical things and thank you for the comments. I will try and pick them up as we go. Um, do you, are these shot JPEG or have you switched the phone to a compressed RAW? No. I'm asking the wrong guy. <laughs> these are all JPEG. Um, 
I'll be honest with you, I don't even know where the raw button is on my phone. Um, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. I've never explored and I don't think it matters. I, I'm not after the best quality images. I'm just after an image that expresses a single moment. Yes. Um, and you know, if I'm waiting for pizza, I'm really not that worried about what the photograph looks like. I'm more interested in how long my pizza's taking. So I don't, I don't worry about the raw side of it. I know there are people that 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 do, and they get really into it. For me, that's not a thing. Um, and you're probably going to ask me next: Do I shoot in the square format? Would that be right? You well done. <laughs> you see how in tune we are. We're we're like yin and yang. I can, I can see the screen reflected in your glasses. So I'm oh, just that's right. <laughs> um, I do. Yeah. So if I if I intend the image to be square, I set it as square, um, and you can do that in the settings of the of the camera um, on the the latest smartphone on the latest iPhones. You just swipe up underneath the, uh, where the where the screen is that shows you the image you're going to take, you swipe up and all the aspect ratios are, are there. Um, you know, but I go through all of these things on the iPhone workshop, which we normally do down around by the Tate, um, you know, which is, you know, always a good, always a good fun day. Yeah, yeah, that's it. All the how-tos are covered on that. Uh, yeah. Sarah's asked about Snapseed or Lightroom. We've covered that already, Sarah, which is Snapseed for Paul on, on mobile. Yeah. Um, uh, this is more of a uh, silly thing to say, but it's more of a Paul image. I, I see this, I know it's you. Yes. Even, even without knowing it's you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because there's lots of your signature kind of line and light and mood and everything else in there. But this could be, I mean, this is it. Am ambiguity, right, is a great thing to play with. Yeah. And this could be a staircase. It could be could cold be. In, a, in a museum or in a lovely building. It doesn't really matter, I suppose, but go on, no. tell me anyway. It's the side of the shepherd's hut where I do the retreats for um, my mindful one-to-ones. Uh, hmm. So I have a, a little traditional shepherd's hut in the, um, uh, in the field outside the house. Um, and while waiting for uh, one of the clients to come back with uh, some pictures from an assignment I'd set, I just noticed the way the light was sort of making a lovely curved shape and the way the shadows were kind of, you know, sort of interacting with it. And I thought, actually, that's quite nice. So I just got the phone out and played. Because when I do a lot of workshops, I don't actually take very many pictures on my real camera. Most of them I do on my phone. Um, yeah, so I, I did this and processed it all while waiting, put the frame on it, um, and then shot a, a sort of several more in a, in a little series. Because I, I like to use it as a challenge to myself. Sometimes if I see an idea, you can sketch out three or four ideas really quite quickly, um, you know, without actually wasting too, you know, wasting any time, mm. um, you know, and you can really sort of get into it. Uh, once you stop thinking, oh, it's only my phone, I'm not doing it properly. I think it's, um, I think what this is very much kind of reinforcing is the fact that, you know, there's, there's compelling images everywhere, which we bang on about. Uh, between us don't we in various guises yeah. in various places um but I, i'm kind of interested in this idea that um you're constantly visually aware and this allows you to uh capture those moments and be creative with them right there and then and this this is an, a really good hopefully example of that which is very beautifully elegant very poor in that sense um and again there's some sort of ambiguity with regards form here but there's lots of space. So some your style comes through in lots of ways and yes, it allows you to be creative in different ways. Um, so I would imagine here you were just caught by this, this line and shape and space. Would you, want, would you might like me to say, yes, Sam, I was and be all kind of artistic about it or shall I tell you the truth? You can do both. Yes, Sam, I was caught by the line of it and the space and the... But the I know what you're going to tell me. Well, I don't know what you're going to tell me, but intent is an important thing, right? You know, something stops you and makes you pick the phone up. Yeah. I mean, this was taken, I did an online um, iPhone workshop um, at, in the, the sort of the heady days of lockdown. <laughs> and I have a selection of dry flowers that I photograph. And what I was doing was a live demonstration of how I photograph something, convert it to black and white, and then print it out. So, this was literally behind me 
um, against a piece of baking parchment on the window. Um, and I'm particularly fond of this, this little Chinese lantern plant. Um, so I photographed it and yes, you're right, the, the line and the, the shape and the space and the relationship between all those bits is what appealed to me. Um, but what I was trying to demonstrate was actually the ease of which you can go from something that looks a bit rough and ready to something that looks very deliberately, intentionally crafted, mm. you know, with something as straightforward as a phone that you have in your, in your pocket. The reason this one's not shot square is because I didn't have a wide enough piece of baking parchment. <laughs> And the the drop on the the leaf was it was just too elegant to to lose. So um, rather than going and getting more baking parchment and sticking it to my window, uh, you know. But again, it's simplicity. It's keeping it simple, and being visually aware all the time is is part of my mindful approach to photography. It's seeing it's the extraordinary in the ordinary, and that's what I really enjoy. You know, it's the, at the end of the day for me, it's all about the image and the moment and the presence. The, the, the camera, and the guys at Fujifilm will hate me for this, the camera is irrelevant. I don't mind whether I use my GFX, my phone, or a little compact camera. You know, it's the eye and the heart that, that get the picture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, well, I think you're about to cry then, Sam. You, uh, no. You know, emotion in your voice it's, it's the pizza um <laughs> mine came earlier um <laughs> ralph who's watching along has got, got a copy of this uh yeah. and who watched it being produced so that's really cool as well isn't it uh, yeah ralph joined that workshop so and, ralph's, uh, been, and ralph's been a good watcher of ours so thank you ralph we appreciate he's that a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good man as ralph he's very imaginative we like it and that's hopefully what using um your creative mind can do for you and that's very liberating isn't it yeah. Paul to, when you yeah. know that it you know it's it can be any time any place now this is obviously more of a wide open scene we've been dealing maybe with more intimate and you know smaller scale yeah. things but they're just as capable uh when you're out and about it doesn't matter where you are from that point of view no and what what I the reason I left I, I sent this image to you is because I was having um I was actually having breakfast. This is Glen Coe. So uh, I'm having breakfast and we're sat at breakfast chatting to the, the workshop group and the light on the mountain just started happening while we we're having breakfast. And it had been a bit dire for, uh, you know, the day before. And I said, oh my God, look at that. The light's coming on the mountain and the dark clouds and, the, you know, and we all got chatting and then all of a sudden everybody got up and left. And then the next thing I saw them all running around the corner with, with their bags and their tripods and I sat there with my bacon <laughs> and I just photographed it on my iPhone by pressing the phone against the window so there were no reflections job done back to the bacon now you know photography isn't life and death um and a bacon butty for me not being vegetarian sorry Sam <laughs> um, you know is more important than going out and getting cold. Um, and I just love the fact that by the time I photographed this and I was back at my bacon butty, the cloud had come in and completely demolished what was a beautiful moment by the time everybody else had got outside with their kit. And sometimes it doesn't matter how much kit you've got, you've got to react in a way that the subject requests. And that's okay, this is the camera that I've got available to me. This is the moment. I'm going to take it now. If you're not set up with a tripod waiting for that moment, you've not got a hope in hell of catching it. Um, and again, you know, careful choice of where you expose and how you expose with the, with the phone gives you an image that you want. And then a little bit of help in Snapseed afterwards um, just gives it the mood that I was looking for. Um, you know, it's not... Um, it's not trying to be clever or belittle anybody. It, it's just saying, you know, sometimes a moment says, take me now. Mm. And the only thing you've got that's available now is the phone in your pocket. Yeah, that, maybe that's part of the press, the press man in you coming out as well a few years later. Oh my goodness. I've gone all the way back to my roots. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
true, isn't it? You know, if you're in a if you're in a live news situation, something might be unfolding in front of you, and it's just get it get it shot. You know, those guys don't care about the stuff; they're, they're just getting the picture because they need the picture. Yeah. Um, you know, and you do. You know, even as a landscape photographer, you still have to react quite quickly to things. Mm. You can spend a lot of time in a location contemplating everything and and you know writing poetry and all the rest of it, which is what I do. But sometimes. It just happens and you have to, you just have to get in there and, and photograph it on whatever you've got available. And yes, I would have loved to have taken this picture on, you know, my GFX, but that wasn't available. I don't take that to breakfast with me, but I do take my phone. So, you know, thank you, Mr. iPhone. <laughs> thank you, Mr. iPhone. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that fleeting light, especially in these sorts of scenarios, in these sorts of locations can, yeah, like you say, can be gone. Yeah. in a second now this is obviously a lot of people may know this particular location um but what's lovely about this is it's a kind of different take on it um in for lots of reasons but um i would imagine that you might have been out with your your full kit on this day i may be wrong but so this this was part of the <laughs> the looking and, and playing idea presumably yeah um this is uh, actually two frames blended together. Um, so I was playing with, uh, with the idea and I was taken by the reflection of the castle. So this is um, a normal shot. And then um, I've done um, a slow shutter picture where I've just kind of moved the camera, moved the phone a little bit uh, to create a bit of blur in the, um, in the sky uh, and then blended the two um, in photo split. Um, and you get this, it was quite a nice effect. And then I translated that into a picture, which I did sort of properly, if you like, on a tripod with uh, the leaf filters and everything and standing there with my umbrella. Um, you know, but it, it's fun to just sort of see where the, you know, where the things are going to work or whether they're not going to work. And, um, you know, you get a very, you do get a very different image. Um, it's still very usable, still pleasing. Um, you know, and and looks very. I should have included the other one, um, the, the the GFX version, um, just so you can see the difference. But it, it has a very different feel to the sort of more traditional photography as well. Yeah, I re I really love it because it's black and white, which yeah, I like black and white. But yeah, it's yeah, it's black and white, but it's black and white. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we know what we mean. <laughs> that's what you have ink for to put it on the page exactly exactly <laughs> end that ink everybody it's, exactly you know don't it's, leave it's, it in the printer it's, it's expensive ink it's, use it use it well use it with purpose exactly exactly um yeah. and thank you everyone who's following along it's fab we've got um, lots of you keeping up with us if, you, if you're enjoying what we're doing drop us a like or a love on the on the post that's really very much appreciated yeah, nobody's gonna like it they're just here because we're charity they're just gonna love us. That's all they do. Paul. Um, now, I, don't love it, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know where this was, um, and this might be completely off topic. But I'm interested by the fact I know when you're out on tours, especially you've done lots of tours in the stands and in Romania yeah. and in parts of the world like that. And I know you like to share your images, so you print using an instax from the yeah. phone to the instax is that right so that's right tell me about that uh, and, and as i say you may not have done it on this one i may have picked a bad image to bring that point up but that part of photography which is, is to do with the sharing especially if you're there with the subject if you're taking a portrait of somebody yeah how important is it for you to share that moment with them and, and it must be great seeing their reaction hopefully yeah, it's, I mean, that's the most important bit um, for me is if I photograph somebody or somebody's allowed me onto their land to photograph something, then I'll always give them a copy of the picture that, I, that I've that i got. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons I shoot JPEG and RAW in my GF, GFX because I'll send the JPEG to the phone, quickly process it in Snapseed and then print it out for them. Um, you know, this was actually in Albania, um, and uh, you know, it was it was just one of those places that we were just kind of ambling around um, abandoned buildings. But when you give people a copy of a photograph that you've taken of them, it's so much more personal than printing 
than, than emailing them a picture or showing them the back of the camera. It's always lovely for people to see it, but you want them to have a keepsake. You know, I mean, my, my little Instax printer, I mean, it's, you know, not, not very big. It, it's sort of lovely. Um, it doesn't weigh anything. And the joy that people get from you giving them a picture, and it also opens up like, that opportunity. It opens up conversation. It opens up um, more photographs. Um, you know, so people will see that you've given them a print and then they'll show their friend and their friend will want a picture. And it might actually access something that you really want to photograph. Um, you know, all those people will be even more helpful at gaining you access to something. You should always, if somebody's giving you the time to have their picture taken, always give them something. You know, because as a news photographer, I was always told if somebody says, can I have a print? And you say, yes, make sure you send them a print because otherwise they will never help you again. Um, so I always, always try and give a print to people. I mean, I've done pictures in villages where I've photographed but literally the whole village and given them all pictures. And it's been great fun. Um, you know, and people get a real buzz out of it and they never forget the day that you turned up. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, it makes the you and them part of the same moment. And like, you're absolutely right. Local access, especially in, you know, areas where we might not share the same language, that becomes a thing that you can share with them. And they, their brother runs something down the road who knows someone who can show you something amazing. And, you know, that's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Are we in Romania here, Paul? Uh, oh, weirdly, we are, yes. Got one right. Yay! You can tell because of the uh, of the Van Gogh haystacks. And yeah. The amazing, my favourite, favourite country of all the tours I do, Romania is the one that I just love. Um, I, I, could, I could almost live there. Yeah, uh, it's um, the stuff I've seen from there, primarily from you, I've, I've really enjoyed. And I'm, I must admit, yes, I do recognise the haystacks and that's probably what gave me the, the hint. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, again, there's lots to say about the image. We could talk about, you know, how the, the shape and the line and everything else and pack full of mood, I think is probably what I would say though, Paul. Was this, was this a particularly, you know, tumultuous day or have we put a lot of that in to bring that energy and feel to it? Um, no, it was quite cloudy. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have brought it out a little bit in, uh, in Snapseed, a little bit of drama. If you click on the drama button and don't overdo it, you get quite, <laughs> quite nice, um, quite nice cloud structure um, you know so um, I'll often use a little bit of drama just occasionally um, and you know when I'm processing images like this I usually have the original and then I do a little bit of work to it save it as a new copy and then do more work on another one and then blend the two together which is not something I would do with um, you know my, my normal camera my real camera um, but this is uh, this is a panoramic as well you can tell it's panorama because the uh, the fence curves in a slightly unnatural way to the bottom right. Mm. <laughs> they were working hard yeah, that day. I'll, yeah, but I'll really, you know, I'll try and shoot a panorama. So you're sweeping, you know, left to right or right to left, whichever way works for you. And then I crop the bit of the image I want because at the point I took this, the super wide angle wasn't available on the on the phone. So I would always shoot a panorama to get the angle that I wanted and then crop it down. Um, and that's something that I, I sometimes do, even with um, you know, my medium format kit, is I'll shoot it as a panorama and then crop it to square after I've blended the frames together. Uh, because it might be that the angle I want is just too wide mm. um, for the lenses that I've got with, you know, and the distance that I'm away from something. So. But I quite, I quite like the way this worked, that little quirky kink um, at the beginning and then just, just winding down. Um, and then, you know, again, using Snapseed in the black and white setting, just playing with the black and white filters, the red, green, yellow, or blue, to see which one makes the image look like I want it to feel. Mm -hmm. So allowing the color image to dictate what the tones do. Um, you know, it's it, it's a wonderful little piece of software. Um, you know, but if if you want to see me at my happiest, join me in Romania because that is a country I am just madly in love with. And the food is. 
Sorry. I remember you telling me, no, I remember you telling me you really, you really loved being there. You're going in May, is that correct? May? Yeah, May. It was postponed this year, so we're going in May next year. It'll be, uh, it'll be my last tour for Light and Land as well. Yeah, so all the more reason to jump on and give them a hard time, everybody. Um, <laughs> totally different pace here. And I know you've used the iPhone in a lot of uh, urban situations because, yes. you know, it's a great thing to play with. Again, less hassle. You, you're probably not going to get hassled by the security guard and as much or as often. No. Um, now, I don't know where we are here, but that's something you, you enjoy doing in the city, isn't it? Whatever, wherever city it might be, even Paris, more yeah. romantic, architecture, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always photographing with the, um, you know, with the phone wherever I go. Urban situations, particularly, like you say, because you don't get moved on by the security guards. If I told you this is actually the back of the seat in front of me while on, the, on a flight to uh, Moscow, would you believe me? I'd be inclined to. Yeah. So if I get, if I get bored, I start playing with the, the phone and just seeing what I can create from what's in front of me or what's around me. Um, visual awareness never ever stops um, and often people will sit there and they'll just you know they'll put the headphones in they'll just switch off in the world which is absolutely fine but as somebody who loves the visual language I like to explore the the beauty even if I manu even if I manufacture it or exaggerate it by multiple exposure or whatever I just love playing with it so I'll sit on planes and trains um, you know, just photographing things and playing with the lines, playing with the patterns um, and, and seeing just what happens. And is it fair uh, to say that's inspired by other scenarios you may have been in? Um, yeah, and other photographers. I mean, you know, I'm a massive fan of, you know, the likes of um, uh, Valda. Um, and this kind of work that you see, I mean, I see a lot of people on the Light and Land tours doing multiple exposures, which I can't do with mine. Fuji um, so I do it with my phone and I love it you know um, it's, it's just great fun just allowing yourself to break out of what you normally do and do something a bit different a bit fun but yeah I mean often I'm inspired by a location to shoot in a different way um, you know so like you say you know cities you've got lots of strong um, sort of architecture and lines and patterns and reflections and they inspire a different way of seeing sometimes um, and I'll often find that if I go out and start photographing with my, with my phone and start seeing images like this, I actually never get the other camera out. I just keep seeing images like this. And it's a gift that keeps giving. <laughs> a bit like Romania. And we're getting a lot of love from uh, Lynn and Chris, who uh, have been to Romania with you and who enjoyed they that have yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I th I, Aladdin is what springs to mind here, Paul, but yes. tell me. Good. So this is another breakfast image. <laughs> you notice the theme. <laughs> Very, definitely, yeah. Food base, yeah. Um, so this was taken um, on the recce of the Free Stands tour. Um, and one of the places that we have, um, we stay overnight, they, they're... Um, they're really old homes that have been slightly modernized, but not in a way that takes away any of the traditional features. And they have these amazing walls, which have got little, um, little cubby holes for one of the, uh, another, another word. And they're all painted wonderful colors with little ornaments in. And I just sat looking at them and I just thought, God, that's so beautiful. While I was waiting for tomatoes to arrive, tomatoes and eggs seems to be the staple of, uh, breakfast there um, and it was so wonderful just to kind of play with the the way the wall was structured and designed and the colors within it and the, the light on it um you know it, it's it's moments like that that you, you just enjoy and it makes it makes something as mundane as tomato and eggs for breakfast actually quite an occasion um and it's not something i ever do you know i've never done anything with any of the these particular pictures I just enjoy photographing them. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a few, th I'm really happy that we've been able to share some of these because it's very easy to put people into photographic boxes as you and I have talked about many times in the past. And, you know, at the end of the day, 
you're a photographer and the, the yeah. subject and the color and the shape and everything else might change. It's, it's a thing inside you that demands your attention visually and demands and drives your creativity. And I think it's really great that we've been able to see some of those things from you, Paul. Um, this uh, reminds me, and again, I'm going to be completely off whack with where we are because it doesn't even matter. But some of the lines and the light and the shadow, you know, when we did a New York chat a number of weeks ago and in those old stations, you know, you see these big booming lines. And so that immediately yeah. makes me think of that. I know it's not that, but it immediately makes me think of that, which is such a lovely thing to play with that perspective that those lines and that shadow give. Yeah. Um, and it's actually in uh, Lewis Castle on, um, on the Isle of Lewis. Um, I was staying there for, um, for a little workshop I was doing and came down in the morning um, after we'd been out early and the light streaming through those windows you know, it, it, could, it couldn't really have been better for me. Um, you know, I was literally just standing there with my mouth open. I thought, I have to photograph that. The only thing I'd got on me was my phone. If I'd gone back upstairs to get my camera, come downstairs, put the tripod up, put the camera up, the light would have moved because the sun does move, well, the earth moves around the sun quite quickly. So it wouldn't stay like that for very long. You know, so I would have missed it. And yes, I could have gone back the next day because I knew that it was going to happen. But actually, the next day it was cloudy. So it didn't happen. Yeah. But you have to seize the moment when it gives, you know, when it's given to you. Um, you know, that was, that was for me was, you know, was a perfect, you know, as perfect a moment as I could get. You know, but looking at it now in the cold light of day, I can see that it's a little bit, a little bit wonky on the left side. The, the symmetry is not spot on, but actually it doesn't really matter. No. And you know um, what, Paul, sorry to jump in. You know what? I, it's piano keys, right? That, that's yeah. what I see. Yeah. The white and the black of the keys in, in the shadow. Thank you. <laughs> I love you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Can you look at all my images and say nice things? I'll, I'll, well, certainly for an hour I will. Um, <laughs> no, no. I, I just saw that. I was, I was looking at it more as you were talking. It didn't yeah. immediately strike me, but, you yeah. know, so... It's great how you can pick these things out of um, out of it. But big tall windows, great place yeah, to be. Always good, windows. right? Um, you know, it reminds me of the Tate Turbine Hall or the windows in the stations in New York. Uh, you know, it's like you say, it's it, they're just opportunities waiting to happen. Um, yeah. So uh, there was a question that you've missed from from Shay, but she's answered it herself. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so it's the photo split at Shay, but Sam's not paying attention. <laughs> so, uh, thank you darling uh we have a, i'm going to get you now because chris has sent a pitch, uh, a question uh which I, we may have talked about um do you add photos from your fuji to your phone and then use photo split to create multiple exposures that way or process uh, a fuji taken photo via snapseed i pro i process the fuji photos by snapseed quite often yes um especially if i'm going to print them out and give them to somebody um i still like them to look like one of my pictures so i will um i will do that um but the um the i've never photographed something on the fuji and then put it into the phone and then do photo split on it um that so that just doesn't feel right for me mm. um and it's all about feeling it just doesn't it just doesn't work for me um mm. i like the the slight rawness of the the phone pictures, the imperfections in them, because the files aren't huge, although they're good quality. Um, and I like the fact that the images break up a little bit as well when you start to mash them around. Whereas the GFX file, not only would it take forever to get across to my phone sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, you'd have to do an awful lot of work on it to mash it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, t tell me about this, Paul, because I had my own thoughts about it when I saw it, but I'm interested. I'm interested in what um, arrested you to pull the phone out. Um, I, I really just like the, the, the two different textures. Um, it's the sort of little algae um, thing sitting on top of a pond that's got lilies in it. And I just was really taken by the kind of, uh, the fact it looks a little bit like gravel. Um, there could be rocks on a beach. Uh, you know, and I just, I just thought actually there's something there, and it was, it was a sketch for, 
an another time because it it there is something in there but i wasn't quite getting it on the day uh you know but it was just it was just nice to sort of see it and then you know tweaked with different filters just to get the contrast between the green of the, the dark green of the lily leaves and the bright green of the the algae um but there's something about the pattern of the algae sort of surrounding the leaves that i'm drawn to but i haven't yet nailed exactly what is catching my eye about it if i'm honest yeah and i, I think the point you make about the texture is really important isn't it you know it, it could be mm -hmm. sand it could be a stony beach and uh, you know sometimes you go and you see bits of rock that are just poking out a little and obviously it's not that but it you know i think that's an ambiguity thing again isn't it and how texture and and actually the plane of something and what's up and down yeah uh, can be a great thing just to mentally play with and visually play with um so i i really actually love that pool for lots of different reasons but we, i haven't got lots of time to go into it but i did want to bring us to this because i think what we've probably shown um i mean we've talked a lot about how you work with it which is kind of what i wanted to talk about not necessarily so much of the press this press that side of things because that's the the boring bit in a way isn't it um but i think we've shown that the using the phone probably a lot of people might have issues about all oh, well, what if i want to do a particular technique a long exposure multiple exposure a pano a macro I, we've shown i think really clearly in these images that that is no longer something to even consider it, it's way we're past that now aren't we yeah definitely i mean it's it's such a versatile piece of kit i mean I, i've had um in fact on the three stands at uh, the last tour i did there we had one client who came with just her iphone wow um and she had the latest iphone and the pictures that she did were really beautiful so you know it's it's all there i mean this is taken up in glencoe again and it's just in panorama mode you know so it's just a sweeping panorama left to right um exposed you know the press the middle of the frame where it's brightest and then the the exposure drops down to to bring in the mood um and that you know that would have taken me a good half an hour 40 minutes on the gfx to do um it was the work of literally 30 seconds and then stopped the car jumped out i mean i was on holiday with my son so i hadn't got time to set everything up literally jump out of the car swoosh with the phone back in the car and then at, you know later on in the evening just process it to how i want it to look um you know and the, the file from that i mean that that's i've printed that up that's you know easily easily three three to four feet wide yeah yeah of the phone that's madness it is madness isn't it yeah do you, a couple of things, just as we finish, Paul, sorry, but because I, I like talking to you about photography. Um, first thing, when you're in the mountains like this, yeah, I, I know in the past you, you, you might have had a certain emotional feeling when you're here. And I would imagine that the slower process that you may use with a, you, you know, your, your big camera, whatever you want to call it, might allow a little more time for you to imbibe that and, and engage in that. Whereas it's quite interesting you mentioned there about this shot and it was more of a passing shot. And I, I know that you do work in that way as well. Obviously you do, we've shown that tonight. But do you, has that changed your relationship with the places in any particular way? Or is it just an evolution of that? I think, it, I think it's an evolution because if you're tuned in, you know, if you're, if you're being visually aware, you, you notice photographs all over the place. You notice opportunities. And I, you know, I wouldn't have photographed that any differently if I'd spent two hours there or, you know, or two minutes. Mm. Uh, because that particular day was one of the best days I've ever seen Glencoe because it was moody, it was dark, the, the, everything was slightly backlit. Uh, it had been raining on and off all day. Um, and actually I was in the, in the van with my son and we were listening to to Harry Potter, which uh, on the audio book, which was filmed up there, and that's all very dark as well. And and I, I I love taking things from other bits of my life that inspire other bits of images. So yes, the emotional and spiritual connection with the place is really important, but also you know listening to um, a story about a place, reading poetry, watching movies, you know they all inspire 
a sort of a, a kind of feeling that when you get somewhere, you can dial into it really, really quickly, really quickly. Yeah. No, that, that's great. I'm glad I, we just spent a minute on that because um, I think hopefully every, a lot of people watching this will know you, especially watching live. A lot of people will know you. Some of you, some people may have heard us do things before. Some people may not have done. But some I think <laughs> yeah, some people exactly yeah yeah. Um, but I suspect that what I think more than anything, okay, we talked about the phone, we talked about how that affects it. I think what's come across for me mostly in this is about being a photographer and what that means day to day and being visually receptive, creative, flexible, uh, inquisitive. Uh, and I think that's something that everyone who loves photography, a lot of you guys watching out there will, will have your own moments of joy with it. And that's the thing to go away and run with. And um, it's such a great thing to have in your life. I, th I don't want to go overboard with this, but I think you and I think very similarly about some of these things. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Paul? And, and this is just one arm of that. Yeah. Um, I, I think you've got to be open to opportunity when it's presented to you. Yeah. you know, visual opportunities come along all day long, but we're often too busy to notice. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are out of time, I'm afraid, everybody. Um, I, yeah. I have just a tiny bit of advertising to do for what's coming up next, uh, which is a slight handbrake turn from the very philosophical things we've just been getting into. Huge thanks for everyone. Great rate. Everybody's staying with us throughout this, which is fab. Uh, Paul and I love the banter, dealing with each other back and forth. And uh, I have a great deal of respect for his photography and more his approach to it and his ethic and uh, how he reacts to the world around him. So hopefully you've all seen that as well. Um, what's coming up next is there is a bit of a break. Uh, you are all probably sick of me hearing my voice and you're going to have two weeks off because I am promised elsewhere in the, in the world, actually. So there's going to be no live stream for the next two weeks, I'm afraid. You can all relax and go and work with your iPhone or your Huawei, I get my teeth in, or your Samsung. Go and, go and create some work, all right? And then the next time we're on the live stream, I want to see some of that work. And hopefully Paul's inspired you to do that. But I'll be back on the 6th of October, Tuesday night, 8 p.m., usual, usual gig. Uh, and I'll be doing a pixel to print. So we're going to walk through an image from Scotland, and I'm going to... Uh, talk about the background, the composition, all sorts of things to do with that, and obviously the processing to the print as well. But from us, um, it's a big thank you, Paul. Good night, mate. Thank you very much for joining me as ever. Good night, Sam. Thank you. Enjoy Italy. Thank you. And for everyone else out there, we will see you very soon indeed in a couple of weeks' time. But for us, good night. Good night.